According to data from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the global economy is on course for a recovery from the shock of the COVID-19 pandemic. Huge fiscal and monetary support by various governments, especially the United States, is fueling the recovery together with the availability of vaccines. The unequal impact of the pandemic on different countries, however, will determine the rate of recovery for the rest of the global economy. Now, this is according to my next guest, who's written extensively about the role of democracy in the context of free market capitalism. His forthcoming book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, explores the complex subject of democracy, business, and development. I'm talking about Martin Wolf. He's the associate editor and chief economist commentator in the financial, at the Financial Mail in London. He joins us now via our video link. Martin, great to chat to you. Thanks so much for making time for our program here in South Africa. Democracy and capitalism as separate topics are are quite complex on their own. A merger of the two is certainly not for the faint-hearted, but you're going straight in to try and pack that. Yes. Um, one tiny correction, it's the Financial Times, but don't worry about it. Big but part. anyway, uh, yes, the, um, the reason I wrote this book, it became obvious to me, oh, I've been writing this book, it's not quite finished, very nearly, uh, is that it became obvious to me um, many years ago, about uh, five years or six years ago, that the political systems of the world, um, the democratic political systems, were under huge stress, that we were seeing the clear emergence of right-wing and left-wing populism, some of it quite anti-democratic in character. Um, I think that's been quite obvious in the United States recently. And, uh, of course, the rise of authoritarianism across the world um, through emerging and developing countries. We can see this very clearly. And this is a reversal of what seemed a very strong democratic upswing from about uh, 1980 onwards. With the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the creation of democratic regimes, including in South Africa, of course, across much of the developing world. So I wrote about why is this happening? And I focus particularly, I have to say, on the Western developed countries. They're my countries and uh, I, sort of where my country is, as it were, our countries uh, of the West. And I was particularly interested in why this uh, dissatisfaction was emerging. And the core reason, I argue, is that the market economy on which we depend for prosperity and which has been a way of underpinning democracy in a way it has been a force for it is also now undermining democracy. Quite interesting. For those who are struggling to connect those dots, perhaps say a bit more about that uh, and also reflect on, on the idea that, for instance, I've always learned in e Economics 101 of this trickle-down effect, you know, that there are people who in the upper echelons of society who will make enough money and if capitalism works right, that money should go down to everybody else at grassroots levels. We obviously don't see that happening, at least in that way, and I imagine those are some of the principles underpinning this uh, discomfort that you're seeing? Yes, I think the relationship between the market economy and the arrival of democracy and the way it works turns out, when you look at it very closely, to be very complicated. And my argument is essentially it's a sort of marriage, but it's a very, very difficult marriage, often with profound tension. Now, if you look at it historically, uh, um, you know, I point out that in 1800, there were no democracies, as we would describe them, anywhere in the world. Uh, there weren't even countries with reasonably wide suffrages. By 1900 already, well, there were quite a number of countries with very wide suffrages. And by 1930, in the West, it was pretty well universal that you had universal suffrage. So that was a remarkable uh, revolution. Why did that happen? Well, I argue that happened because uh, the, uh, the market was successful in generating in the Western world uh, uh, sustained rises in prosperity after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and those led to new jobs, new opportunities, new demands for education, very important, new demands for inclusion of the population because they were going to be educated. They need, demanded political rights. And they, these were, with lots of struggles, finally granted. 
and we saw this new form of society, democratic capitalism, emerge, something that had never happened before. But, of course, uh, while I believe that in the long run, really a long run, rising prosperity tends to benefit or can benefit uh, everybody, it doesn't happen automatically, and that's to your trickle-down point. It requires policy. It requires uh, politics, and democratic politics is there to ensure that, uh, th that the market economy properly supported continues to function and generate prosperity, but also to ensure that the benefits of the market economy are mm. spread through the development of the welfare state, through the, uh, the, the development of, in particular, of universal education, which I think is incredibly important. All of this requires government support, and this relationship has broken down in the West, most obviously, in the last 30, 40 years, because over that period, the development of the economy in many countries has not benefited everybody. Right. And that's created huge dissatisfaction uh, and conflict, uh, which has also taken cultural forms. There have been cultural tensions, which I think are a symptom of this. Uh, uh, in many countries, in America, obviously, uh, racial tensions as well. And I argue that if we don't recreate a... Uh, a form of economy and politics which makes everybody feel that they have a prospect of doing better, our democracy is likely to end up in some form of authoritarianism. Yeah, that's because um, what happens in the economy and in society, at the very least, needs buy-in. If people don't believe that the systems will work in their benefit, they're unlikely to comply. But, you know, issues around the market and the tenets of democracy often can feel very elusive for the many people probably watching our conversation now, how do we bring it back home in the context of COVID-19 and talks of some kind of global economic recovery plan when there are so many countries still lagging behind because of the inequality brought on by capitalism, but also because of the inequality brought on by what the World Health Organization says is a grotesque uh, difference in how the vaccines have been rolled out? Well, the, this is one of the deep tensions in my book Democracy, political systems are national. We are divided into hundreds of countries, 200 countries roughly, uh, after the clearly very welcome collapse of the empires. So we have 200 countries, but unfortunately, that was the subject of an earlier book of mine, these are wildly unequal countries. This is the legacy of a very long and complex history. And uh, so when we have these global shocks, we respond with a mixture of global action, there is some global action, but also intense national action because the national governments all feel accountable to their citizens. And that means, of course, that rich countries with large pharmaceutical industries and all that goes with it are able to produce, consume, buy the vaccines first. And so we get this radical inequality, which in a way is a byproduct of democracy, because democracy, as I said, is not global. We don't have a global democracy. We have national democracies. And that's, of course, a profound dilemma, too, because while I argue there's a relationship with national democracy and capitalism, there is also, of course, a relationship between capitalism and the world. And we have profound responsibilities to the world as a whole and the COVID-19 is demonstrating these conflicts, these profound tensions between the national and the global, between the more prosperous countries and the less prosperous countries in the most profound and disturbing way. Given that, what does then a post-pandemic uh, economic world order look like? Well, at the moment, it's, I have to say, in honesty, it's looking pretty bad. Uh, we haven't managed to mount global cooperation on a suitable scale. So it looks to me as though the recovery will be very uneven globally. Uh, countries which have huge fiscal and monetary room for maneuver and vaccines, like the United States, the UK to some degree, will go ahead pretty rapidly, will recover pretty rapidly. And it looks at the, to me at the moment as though universal vaccination, which is a stupendous challenge organizationally, it requires probably the production of something like 12 billion uh, doses of vaccine in a year, which is a staggering task. That's just not going to happen. 
uh, for that reason, travel won't reopen. And lots of economies, I think, are going to flounder um, in the developing world. And there are also going to be a lot of debt problems. So I fear we're going to emerge from this pandemic more unequal globally, uh, though possibly less unequal within some countries than, they, than we were before. Mm, sobering. Often when we speak about these macro elements, for lack of a better term, people feel they don't have much agency to change what affects them directly, and perhaps they're right. Um, but, I mean, upon deeper reflection, do you imagine a context where individuals in these countries uh, that are so adversely affected by how interconnected we are can do something where they are to, I guess, advocate for better prospects, better change? This is a really interesting, important question, and it, it comes down to two things. First, obviously, their agency domestically. I mean, I do think that most countries, not the very poorest perhaps, but most countries have some degree of agency in, in governing their fate, though of course their, their room for new maneuver is much more limited than those of others in this hugely unequal world we have as a product, which is a product of four or five hundred years of history. Um, so there is some agency domestically, but a really important question is what sort of governing systems we can create globally and how might uh, the, politi the politics of emerging and developing countries affect this global order. The, the tragedy at the moment is I would say that global cooperation is going backwards. We had, there were sort of dreams of this after the Second World War and again after the fall of the Soviet Union that we would have a more integrated world, a more cooperative world. Uh, we'd work harder to achieve development goals and so forth. And now all this seems to have faded away. And it's faded away in part because of what I talked about, this, the tensions and divisions within developed countries have forced domestic politicians, even quite well-meaning ones like Joe Biden, back in a very nationalistic frame of mind. He's really focusing entirely on Americans. Mm. And if the, the, the rich countries do that, um, then, of course, they ignore the concerns of most of the world. In addition to all this, of course, we have the beginning of a Cold War between the two superpowers. So, unfortunately, uh, the most difficult area in which to make progress is towards good cooperative global governance. And the forces I'm talking about, I think, are making this worse. Fascinating discussion. Martin, I have to thank you for your time. Really appreciate you coming onto the program and sharing with us what you've been able to learn. The book to look out for is called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. Uh, Martin Wolf there uh, is the uh, associate editor at the Financial Times in London. Martin, once again, thanks very much indeed. In fact, make sure to catch Martin later today in conversation with Anne Bernstein, the executive director at the Center for Development and Enterprise. That discussion uh, likely to take place at around 5 p.m. South African time. All registration details, we're told, are at the CDC's website. That's www.cdc.org.za. Martin, thanks again. Uh, really appreciate it indeed.